folk know that I am recording this event. Um, and so for people who wanted to join the call but were unable to join the call, um, we're gonna record this and then we'll upload it to YouTube and we'll share it um, like in a, a few days, you know, maybe if not by the end of the week, definitely by next week. So that way folk can have access to this information. Um, I'm going to be toggling a bit between sharing my screen and also kind of like keeping an eye on uh, the chat. So I ask that everybody keep themselves muted um, and I will let you know when the space is open and available for questions. So you can either drop a question in the chat. We will also have a time for Q&A where you can unmute yourself and you can ask questions. We tried to leave a nice hefty amount of time for, for Q&A because um, we felt like folks were going to have some questions. And so I'm going to share my screen with you so we can do a little bit of introductions of who the folk are um, this evening. Marisol, can I ask you to keep an eye on the waiting room? So if somebody rings the doorbell, can you let them in? Awesome. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. So y'all should be able to see this. Can y'all see this? Give a thumbs up if you can see this. Okay, good, 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 good. So <clears throat> this evening, I already talked about who are the groups who are, are hosting this event, but I, I wanna give you a sense of what we're gonna talk about tonight. So we're gonna talk about understanding your rights um, um, when you are either going to go to the hospital or if you're going to um, use a birthing center we want to make sure folk know um, how to prepare for that and also know what your rights are and what are the types of questions that you should um, ask folk um, as you're preparing for birth. And Andy, and I'm going to do introductions in a second, are going to walk us through that portion of the conversation. Um, and then we're going to walk people through like how to create your own birth plan. So whether this is baby number one or baby number four, um, it's, I think a blueprint always helps trying to figure out like what it is that you want, what is it that you desire, making sure that people have a sense of um, the things that are very important to you and your family, you and your partner, you as an individual. Um, and so the birth plan piece will give you a sense of like what a birth plan is and how that birth plan actually kind of gets activated um, while you are delivering. And then we will have, um, some conversation about how to prepare yourself for postpartum wellness. Um, what are you, things you need to keep in mind, considerations for when you come home um, with the baby and um, how do you make sure that you are safe and the baby is safe. And then we're gonna open the floor up for Q and A. So tonight's speakers, we have Cheryl Carroll. Cheryl is a nurse midwife. Like first of all, everybody in Durham knows Cheryl. I, I, this is the, this is the they do like when I said that you were going to be the midwife on the call, they was like, oh, I know Cheryl. Like everybody knows Cheryl, and everybody was very excited about Cheryl. So Cheryl is a certified nurse midwife, um, also a board certified adult psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, and clinical nurse specialist. Um, right now is in a nursing doctoral student, and is also a sex therapist and provides therapy for. Um, individuals and couples and the like and we're really excited to have Cheryl on the Zoom with us this evening. Uh, the next person we have is Brandy Collins Calhoun. Um, I have known Brandy now, it feels like I've known Brandy for 15 years but we've really really known each other like three or four years. Um, Brandy is a amazing radical birth and sex educator and a full spectrum doula. Um, right now Brandy is splitting their time between being the senior movement engagement associate um, at the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy, as well as the director for reproductive and maternal health at the YWCA in Greensboro. Um, Brandy also is a member of the Echoing Ida writers community with, it's, it's four together, right? Right, with four together. And this is a, co a collective of Black women, femmes, gender non-conforming, gender non-binary folk um, who are writing about justice issues. And it's, it's a beautiful collective of folk. And I'm excited that Brandy is a part of that, that collective. Um, 
We also have Marcella of Mars Kamara. Uh, Mars is a doula and a reproductive justice advocate. Mars is also a cultural organizer and a tribe member of Spirit House. Um, she is the um, curator and creator of Young, Gifted, and Broke, which is an artist pop-up gallery and creative consult consult consultancy and also collective. And so she works with different artists locally um, and across the state to, to bring art directly to the community and also support local artists. And so we're excited to have Marcella. And then we have Brittany Thomas. And Brittany is also a full spectrum doula with a particular specialty with postpartum care and support. Um, she's a women's advocate. She studied under Latham Thomas. Some folk might be familiar with um, Mama Glow. And so <coughs> she is a student of Latham Thomas and um, offers remote doula services as a Cali native and the mama of three amazingly beautiful black genius children. Our kids went to school together, so that's why I'm waxed and poetic about that. So we are going to kind of kick into this first portion of the conversation. Each, each presenter is going to have about 15 minutes or so to kind of walk you through some pieces. And we're going to talk about right now understanding your rights and preparing yourself for hospital or the birthing center. And so we're going to kick it to Cheryl and um, make sure that you are unmuted. Yep, you are unmuted. Well, I mean, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And really, just it's an honor to be able to sit on a, a panel of such fantastic women who bring such fullness to the lives of so many. And it means so much. And um, just grateful uh, to be here with you all and the participants. Thank you so much for coming. You know, it's, it's a blessing. I'm a certified nurse midwife. And um, that means a lot of people are familiar with what a certified nurse midwife uh, is. And um, I'm a registered nurse. And then I went to graduate school for additional training in women's health and midwifery. So I take care of women um, all through the reproductive age group. I take care of um, perimenopausal women, postmenopausal women. So uh, my youngest patients, might be 10 or 11 years old, and my oldest patients might be in their 90s. So uh, it's a wide range of there, and, and mostly uh, the focus is on the normal expectations, um, and it could be birth control, it could be anything, but um, we don't do surgery unless we are surgical assistants in certain procedures such as C-sections or tubal ligations or things like that, but, um, we are well versed in normal okay and we have a different philosophy of care in that um, it is a joint venture it is a conversation that you have with somebody that this person that comes into your office or comes to your exam room um, they're allowing you to come into their very personal space and you are there to help them make a plan to make their best health decisions possible and so that's pretty much what a midwife is. And some of your participants or some of you on the panel, you have uh, been to see midwives or might be familiar with midwives. Um, if you are not, I would encourage you to do so because it's a wonderful place to be. And I can tell you after 30 years experience, I have no regrets of my chosen, my calling, my profession, and I'm so glad to be here and to last as long as I have. Go ahead to the next slide, thank you. So many people, when they are preparing for birth, even women that are not pregnant, when they imagine what, is, uh, what birth is gonna be like, you know, they have this picture in their mind. And some people have really frightening pictures. And other people have really strong, firm, uh, pictures about what my birth will be like. And one of the big things that I hear from people before they're going into the hospital now with the COVID-19 pandemic is, well, that picture's gonna change. Everything that I imagine, it's not gonna happen. All the things that I hope for, it can't be. And that's not necessarily so. It can be different. It might not be exactly what you imagine, but let me throw this in here. When under ordinary circumstances, when there is no pandemic, 
Many people have birth experiences that were not like what they imagined. This is not what I thought it would be. Even when it's baby number three or baby number four, you know, I just thought my birth was gonna be such and such and I was completely surprised at what happened. So one of the things that I tell people as they are preparing for their delivery, pandemic or no pandemic, one is um, to be able to trust. And that trust means I am going to trust my ability to make a decision. I'm going to trust my ability to seek out as much information as I can. I'm going to trust my ability as a human being, as a human being with an intentional design that if I can become pregnant, if I can carry my pregnancy, that I will be able to deliver my baby. Now, that looks different for different people, you know, the fine points too, but there must be some sort of trust in there so that you can march in there with confidence that you will know exactly what you need to do. So you have to trust in your personal power. Okay, so that is very important, and that is pandemic or no pandemic. And that means that uh, also you trust in your ability to communicate these things. So just like the picture that you place in your mind about what birth will be like, you have to imagine how you will communicate what, what that is, how you will say that to the partner that might come with you. Uh, for that delivery or to the care provider that is um, taking care of you in that clinic setting or to communicate that to the nurse that checks you in onto labor and delivery. Um, you have to be able to say the things that are on your mind. You know, nobody there is a mind reader. We will do our best. We will try to extend kindness and understanding and care, but your specifics are yours. They are unique to you. And sometimes we need to hear what that might be. Now, some people, they're very verbal. Boy, they can get right on it and they can tell you everything that they need to say and they don't even miss a beat. And other people are very internal. And so sometimes it's helpful for them to write it down. Um, those things that are most important that are unique about them. And then other people rely on a partner or somebody with them to be their advocate. But make sure that that communication with your advocate is clear. So that if there is something happening with you that they are speaking the words that you all have already communicated before you got there. So it's very important to be able to share clearly what that is. So while you're imagining what it will be like to feel that first contraction, to feel that final contraction before you begin to push your baby out, before you have that urge to bear down, that you have a way of communicating those things to the people that are around you and to have an expectation that they are going to hear you. So you walk in there with the confidence knowing that I will communicate and you must hear me and to expect that and to have a standard of respect for yourself when you go into labor and delivery and to have a standard of respect for the people that will be caring for you. Because this is a mutual partnership that will help bring forth your baby and help create that foundation that you have already established before you walked into those doors. Um, some of the ways that people are clear is when they go to their visits that they uh, make best use of them. A lot of obstetric visits, if you ever look at a, a care provider's schedule, um, these visits are anywhere between seven to 20 minutes. It's just depending on what kind of provider you see. And so you've got to use it the best way you know how. Some providers will do this. You walk in the room, hey, how you doing? Everything looks great? Yeah, oh yeah, feel the baby move? Mm -hmm. Do it okay? Yep, listen to the baby, okay, take care. And they might not even sit down. They might not even make eye contact with you because they know if they do, you got them. So if you have something important to say, you make sure you make eye contact with them. You make sure that 
you know, you have the opportunity to say what you need to say. And sometimes that might be, could you sit down, please, so that we can really have a conversation about this? <laughs> and it's okay. It's okay to do that. And you might have questions about what will happen when I get to labor and delivery? What will happen if such and such happens? When you have those questions asked. Now, there's a nice variety of people there, um, you know, in the participants and here on the panel, and you might have different experiences with different facilities. You know, people go different places and um, where they're going to deliver their babies. Some people are going to deliver their babies at home. But at least you need to know what are the policies? What happens in these places when I go there? I can tell you about the policies at, at Duke Regional Hospital. I know, I know what happens there. Um, and with COVID-19, anybody that comes there to be admitted is going to have a rapid test for COVID-19. They all are, if you're going to be admitted. If you're just going for triage or um, some problem visit and you know you're going to go home, they're not going to test you unless you are symptomatic. Okay? The respiratory therapist comes to labor and delivery to do the test, and it's a swab inside the nostril. The test returns in 15 to 30 minutes. If your test comes back positive, but you do not have any symptoms, you will be in your room. If you bring somebody with you to labor with you, that one person that you bring with you is there in the room with you, you not be going out of the room. If you are tested negative, you're able to walk around, okay? And you can go outside of the room. Um, the partner will be able to go to the coach's corner, to the cafeteria, or wherever um, your birth partner uh, needs to go, your birth partner can do that. But if you're positive, no, that won't happen. You'll be able to use any of the equipment. It will not restrict whether or not you can uh, use a birthing ball or uh, use a bar or stand when you're labor or your different positions or getting into the tub. You can do all of those things. There is no restriction there. Okay. Now, if you are positive and you're asymptomatic, when your baby gets here, the pediatricians will say, we will give you the option to either room in with your baby, you just wear a mask when you breastfeed, or, and, um, or you can separate and isolate your baby. You are given that option, okay? So um, some women choose to isolate because they have a, a great deal of anxiety. And other, the majority of people will choose to have their baby rooming in with them because they're going to bring that baby home. If they're asymptomatic, they are going to be discharged. And they try to get you out of the hospital as quickly as possible. If you develop symptoms, then that changes, that changes everything. And it depends on the severity of illness and you might wind up in a special bed in the intensive care unit and then there is isolation. It does not mean that you cannot pump. You can, you can still do that. Um, but at any time, and while that might be restrictive for some people because, hey, I plan for my mom to be there and I wanted uh, my partner to be there and, and I wanted to switch out every now and then with my sister, and I wanted to, that might not happen. That might not happen. And if so, this is where we use our, our devices that come in handy, that you can be anywhere with them. And don't ever think that when you walk into these experiences that you're gonna walk into them alone and isolated. You are not, because you carry the expectations with you. You carry the voice of that loved one with you, that person who encouraged you, whether it was somebody in the clinic, somebody at your house, somebody at your community, somebody in your church, somebody in your mosque. They whispered the words to you that will stay with you when you are in labor and deliver your baby. You will not be alone, okay? You are never alone. Um, there needs to be some sense of expectation when you go into this experience. There should be an expectation today that, hey, this is the day that I have and this is how I'm gonna live it. And the same thing when you walk into that hospital in labor, we encourage you, wait as long as you can. Don't come into the hospital too early. Have a conversation, pick up the phone. Hey, I'm in labor, I think. And these are what my symptoms are. 
have that conversation before you can get there because it's so disappointing to go there and you're three centimeters mm. and your contractions are every seven minutes. Mm. It would be great to have a conversation with your doula, with your care provider, with somebody to know what's going on. Now, if you are a low risk patient, you don't have anything funky going on with your health that says, hey, you have to get there early. We need you to get there early. But if that's not the case and you're a normal laboring woman, then that says, hey, when they're, you know, really hot and heavy, they active labor, you're about five or six centimeters. Hey, that's a good time to come. That's a good time to come. If your water breaks, give them a call and say, hey, my water broke. And they'll ask you, you know, the color and all of that, and are you contracting? And then you, they can make a decision with you. You're coming together to make a decision, well, when should I come in? And they will let you know. They will let you know. And so having that conversation, being able to communicate, being in that relationship with the people that support you, your partner, your doula, your midwife, your OB, whoever it is, please have that conversation. And let me tell you something, when you walk into labor and delivery, when you expect and invite, that also includes the relationship of the nurses that you come into contact with. You know that the majority of the people that you come into contact with, at least in my life and my world at Duke Regional. Okay, I can't speak for every hospital, but we want to see the best for you. We want the best outcome for you and for your baby. And we'll do our best. Will you always agree with everything that we say? No, I haven't met that person yet. But will we melt because you disagree? Because you wanna have a conversation? Because you wanna talk about what's important to you? I want to hear your words. I want to know a different way of looking at things. I want to know a different way of thinking about it. I want to be able to open up my expectations and I invite you to come in that space because I want to make this work for all of us. Um, the next one. Yes, sorry about that. Just got a text message from the 11 year old downstairs asking if he can have an apple. <laughs> so when you said go and I was like, oh yes, yes. <laughs> These are just some of the... Mama multitasking, mama multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are just some of the organizations yes. that are helpful. You know, everything that I told you that, happened at, that happens at Duke Regional, that's for this week. <laughs> because they've been changing, you know, the guidelines every week. Something different has happened. And they've loosened up quite a bit, you know, from three weeks ago, oh my goodness, this is, this is great. But uh, the CDC website about um, uh, protocols and um, it's very helpful information, open to the public, anybody can go there. NIH, if you like to read detailed, heavy duty articles, great, go for it. Um, MotherToBaby.org, people that have had exposures to certain drugs, medications, great place. MomBaby.org, that's out of UNC wonderful information. So all of these are great resources, different types of resources that are pertinent and relevant um, to your care, whether pregnant or after the baby is born, great resource. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alma. I appreciate you. Give, give thanks. I really, we really wanted to make sure that we had um, a midwife on this call to be able to kind of do what you just did, which was kind of ground us with some like some good energy. Um, so we're going to shift gears a little bit and um, Brandy's going to kick in and Brandy's going to start us off with like kind of helping people Come understand. on, Brandy. <laughs> Brandy got fans. Brandy got fans on this call. Yes. Brandy, as soon as we said social media, it was like Brandy's going to be on. Folk were like, oh, oh, I was like, okay, okay. I was, I was like, your security. I was like, okay, everybody, I need you to calm down, relax. Brandy will be here in a moment. So go ahead and unmute yourself, Brandy. Kick it off for us. I don't know. What you're about here, but, um, peace, y'all. I'm Brandy. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, for those of you who uh, missed the intro part, I'm a full spectrum doula and a number of other things. 
Um, so just to kind of jump into it, what is a doula? Doulas are folks that provide continuous emotional and physical support. Um, a lot of the language around it is like, oh, they're a trained professional that's going to be with you when you give birth. So a lot of that is like colonizing language that really pisses me off because black doulas, doulas of color don't have to go to like bone training and things of that sort. Um, but the simple fact of like this is inherited ancestral work that we're doing. A lot of it comes from personal spaces. Um, so doulas are all the things. We, however, are not midwives. We are not medical professionals. We are not clinical. Um, my favorite go-to story is my sister was in labor and her father-in-law was like, I'm going to step out so Bernie can see how dilated she was. And I was like, no, Bernie, I'm not doing none of that. Um, so we are not clinical. We are not such an cervix. We're not doing none of that. Um, but doulas are that consistent support. Um, because like Cheryl named, you know, there are midwives, there are staff, there are so many amazing people um, in these hospitals and birth centers that are providing continuous support for so many other people, um, especially right now with everything going on. So, you know, you might have a nurse that has um, several patients on their floor, so they can't be in there for every moment. They can't give you round the clock care like you would like, that would be the most helpful, but doulas are there. Um, so like I said, they're that continuous support. Sometimes that looks like physical support if you are someone who is a fan of physical touch and comfort measures. So sometimes that's different massage techniques helping you get into the same sort of positions. And sometimes that's emotional support, affirmations, mantras, and you know, and there's a lot of different kinds of doulas. There are doulas that are on the internet and all these things. You're, you're breaking uh, up a, a teeny bit. You're good. Keep going. Can y'all hear me now? Yes. Okay. I don't know what just happened. Um, where was I? So there are different kinds of doulas. Um, I personally subscribe to um, I am a twerk doula. I am a fan of being in labor and delivery. And we're going to squat and we're going to pop so that baby come down and that baby come out. Um, so a doula is so many things and there are so many different types. So you have so many different options. Um, I'm definitely an advocate for interviewing and getting to know multiple doulas. Um, I've had people that were referred to me because people were like, oh, Brandy is this great doula and she has all these resources, but that doesn't mean that I am the doula for you. And that is sometimes a really hard thing for folks to hold because they think all doulas do all the same things. Therefore, you can just pick one and they work. But your doula needs to be like your midwife or your OB. It needs to be someone that you feel comfortable with, that you feel most supported with, and that can advocate for you the way that you would like to be advocated. Um, so for some people, they want doulas that are going to be not just outspoken, but not afraid to clap back at the provider, not afraid to, you know, be a little stern with folks. And some folks want midwives, that, I mean, not midwives, doulas that are going to be a little more quiet and advocate for them in other ways. So, and then there's different kinds of doulas. Um, so I consider myself a full spectrum doula because I've done work as um, a birth doula, a postpartum doula, an abortion doula, a bereavement doula. Um, so doulas support people who birth infertility in a lot of different ways. Um, one thing that I can say with COVID the way that it is right now, if you have the ability and the capacity to get not only a birth doula, but a postpartum doula, just someone that you have that continuous support from after you give birth, that is a great thing to look into as well. Um, because right now, midwives and providers are very overwhelmed, like many other medical professionals are right now. And sometimes postpartum doulas are going to be a little more accessible in that moment until you can get in touch with your midwife or provider. So I definitely recommend if you're able to get a postpartum doula um, to do so. So yeah, we can go to the next slide. So reproductive justice. Um, I highly recommend if you're going to get any kind of birth support or when you're picking your provider, make sure somebody who's doing it through a reproductive justice lens. Um, so reproductive justice is essentially the right to have children or not have children. And if you do choose to have children, that you have the right and the access to the communities and resources you need to parent them effectively. Um, 
into what you consider however you want to parent. So um, RJ, right now in the state of COVID, when we're talking about birthing options, when we're talking about parenting options, that looks like having the options and the access to midwives or OBs or having options and access to birthing centers versus hospitals. Um, so there are a lot of things that really go into RJ, but definitely right now in the state of COVID, um, what I'm seeing on the ground is um, a lot of conversations around access that weren't necessarily being had before um, because alternatives were, what's the best way to say this? I don't got a ship approach coach shit, we all family. Um, alternatives were demonized. People didn't want folks, especially black folks, choosing midwives. They didn't want us in their birth centers. But now that hospitals and OBs are looked at as terrifying and, you know, COVID is raging through labor and delivery, allegedly. Um, they want people to look at the option of midwives and birth centers way more than they were advocating for people to have access to them before, um, which I find very ironic. But when we have conversations around birthing and access and why it's so important, um, and I, I want to honor everyone's space and capacity, but I also want to name, like when we're talking about black and brown people and birthing, it is an act of resistance and it is a radical act when you think about what giving birth while black looked like prior to COVID. When we look at the maternal mortality numbers, um, it's really important that we had access to adequate care prior, care prior to this, but now it's even more important because we are those high risk people that they were talking about. Um, so yeah. Sorry, I feel like I'm like the Kool-Aid man of birth spaces. I'll be busting up in with stuff and I'm sorry, but it'd be like that. We can go to the next slide. Um, so knowing your rights. Knowing your rights is a lot of different ways when it comes to birth any other time, but right now in the state of COVID, it's important to know that you have the right to have a positive birthing experience, no matter your COVID status, no matter your exposure. So that means that people don't get to treat you um, like shit just because you might have been exposed to someone who had COVID or because you have been tested for COVID and you are positive, that doesn't mean that they have the right to give you piss poor care or not speak to you or be as present as they should be. You should have access to the same positive birthing experience that you would have with or without COVID. Um, so that's like right number one. Know that no matter where you're giving birth, you have the right to that access and that respectful care. Um, the other thing that you have the right to, you have the right to ask questions and make demands. Um, Cheryl was naming, you know, when you talk to your provider and you're having these different conversations, um, know that there's, there's no such thing as dumb questions and you have the right to question anything that they're doing. So when you're talking to providers, you have the right to ask them, okay, what are your protocols even outside of COVID? When COVID isn't happening, what are your C-section rates? How are you showing up for people? How do you provide care? What do you support? What don't you support? Um, because it's important to know that these are people that would care for you if COVID wasn't happening. That these aren't people that are just doing it because now they have to and the hospital is saying that they have to. That they're gonna provide you that care no matter what. Um, you also have the right to ask them what prenatal and postpartum care is gonna look like. So folks that are early on in their pregnancies who don't know what COVID is gonna look like in your third trimester, you have the right to ask them, do you have an action plan for if COVID is still here in my third trimester? What are your protocols? What's on standby? Do you have a plan or is it gonna be pure chaos if it comes and my care is up in the air? You have the right to ask those questions. You have the right to find another provider if they don't give you the answers that you want. Um, my bad job, I'm going through my notes. Let's see. Mm -hmm. You have the right to ask the hospital their protocol. Um, so things that people don't usually know they have the right to ask, you, ha you have the right to say you don't want a bunch of people in and out of your room. That's one thing about giving birth. Every few hours, sometimes it's a different tech, somebody from the pharmacy, a different nurse, a different midwife, lactation. If you want to truly lower your exposure and lower that anxiety, and for you, that looks like as few people coming in and out of your room as possible, you have the right to tell the hospital that, and they have to, or they have to abide by that unless there is some reason that these folks have to be in your room, but you have the right to ask that that not happen. You have the right to ask not to be touched. You have the right to ask to not be checked as many times as sometimes they do. These are all things that you can ask for and advocate for yourself or your doula or support team ask for you to have. Um, you have the right to, um, especially when it comes to nursing right now. Um, so I live in Greensboro. 
So a lot of my work is in Women's Hospital with Cone Health, which is a baby-friendly hospital, which um, is accreditation that you get, which means that you support different birthing people and experiences, um, and especially lactation. Um, they're pushing lactation in a different way right now because of everything going on with COVID. If you are going into these hospitals and birthing centers and you do not want to nurse, you have the right to tell them that, and they have, they're going to listen to you. They're going to have to. So if you don't want lactation consultants in there 24 seven pushing nursing in your face, if you wanna be transparent with them, you have that right and they have to honor that. Um, you also have the right to accept or deny any tests or procedures, which isn't something that a lot of providers are going to tell you, but especially when it comes to having an informed consent around what tests are being done on your babies. Right now, there's a lot of they're using the current climate to scare a lot of people into tests and certain things that normally they would not. Um, and you have the right to ask questions. You have the right to deny anything um, that they wanna do to you or your baby. Um, and you have the right to have an advocate. I mean, there are hospitals, I know right now Cone Health is not allowing um, doulas in the room, but you're allowed, you have the right to have virtual support. Um, and one thing that I recommend, um, and this kind of trickles over into the birth plan part, but if, what I can say is that I can always tell the difference between a nurse or a provider that has a doula background. Um, so nurses that have been through doula training, things of that sort, you have the right to request that. You can ask is, if there's, is there a nurse on staff that is also a doula because there's a difference in that care that kind of shows up. So you have the right to ask all those things and ask you know, people that are coming into your room, what has your exposure been? How are you handling COVID? How are you protecting yourself? How do I know that you're taking COVID seriously outside of this space? Because one thing I can say, definitely we want to believe that everyone is doing everything they can to prevent it, but we know that every household is handling COVID differently. I can tell you now, if I got to tell my mom to stay her ass in the house one more time, I'm going too fast, <laughs> okay? Everyone is handling it differently. Honor yourself and your body and your babies and in the best way, best way possible. And a big part of that is advocating for yourself. Um, and your birth plan is a really big way to do that. So I'm really excited that this is a part of the conversation too. So, yep, I think I'm done. What's the next slide? Is it me? I think, I think, no, you're right. That was Grace. You're amazing. Thank you, Brandy. You think I did there? Okay. You did great. You did fantastic. And I love you. So, and next up we have Marcella and Marcella is going to walk us through the process of how to create a birth plan. So, Let's go. Hey, y'all. Um, I'm Marcella. I'm trying to control my dog, so hopefully he doesn't start barking um, insanely during this whole process. But um, yeah, I'm happy to be here today. Um, can you go to the next slide? I'm going to talk a little bit about birth planning and the importance of birth planning and some of the considerations we may need to make um, with birth plans during the age of the pandemic. So what is a birth plan? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It's um, a document that communicates a birthing person's desires for um, their birth experience. And I kind of, we have an example here in the PowerPoint. Um, this one's pretty basic. There are many different kinds and they have all kinds of considerations depending on the kind of birth that folks wanna have. But some questions that may arise there depending on whether it's a hospital birth or a home birth, um, who's gonna be in the room, um, what kind of soothing support they may need, whether they want to have like essential oils or things like that. Do they want to move around um, in the hospital? Do they want to walk? Do they want the room to be quiet? Do they need music? Do they want an epidural? Um, what questions look like if, there, if the possibility of a C-section arises? Those are the kinds of things that a birth plan considers. Um, and they're very important because the birth plan gives the birthing person and their support system autonomy and also acts as a guide for birth workers and their support team to make sure that you're making sure this person's having the birth experience that they want to have um, and that they're the most autonomous, autonomous that they can be. And a birth plan, I always say, is like the most ideal situation for your birthing experience. But we know that like things can change very rapidly, like a pandemic can happen. <laughs> so there are always considerations to, to be made and also like making people realize that like they have to be flexible. Um, I'm gonna pause for one second because my computer is about to die. So let me get the charger, hold on one second. While Marcella is um, getting her, her charger, I would, I would share or offer 
Um, I, you know, I've been pregnant three times, um, have given birth twice, um, had a miscarriage in between. And the difference between not having a birth plan when I was 25 and having a birth plan at 41 was significant. It was, it was significant. Um, it was significant for me and what I think Cheryl and Brandy talked about in terms of my own peace of mind and having um, a process and a vision for what I wanted my birthing experience to look like. And then to be able to share that information with everybody who was going to be a part of that journey with me and that process with me and having them see me and respect what I was saying to them um, and walking through that. So I was also clear about what was going to be available to me. I had my, my last son at Durham Regional, Cheryl. So um, an Avis artist um, delivered Taj and she was fantastic. And she did everything that I asked her to do. So I was just, I was chatting, Marcella, while you were plugging in your... your, your thank life. you. Thank you. I always appreciate your, you know, mommy, firsthand mommy experience. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I was saying that um, a birth plan is a guide, not only for the birthing family, but also for the birth support. So for I'm a doula and for other doulas and birth workers, it just make, allows us to make sure we're supporting the person the way they want to be supported. And essentially, I feel like one thing that's kind of lost in birth plans is they should be accessible. Um, you don't, they don't always have to be words and checkboxes. There can be pictures. Um, the font size can change depending on like what the person's, you know, visual needs are. Also, there may be language needs and not even just thinking about translating it, but also like some people just have different diction. They use different slang and birth plans can always be considerate, be considerate of those, of that context. Um, as I said, everyone's birth plan is different. And just like Brandy was saying, and like, you know, you may be a great birth worker, you may, you may be a great doula, but you may, may not be the best doula for that person based on what they want for their experience. So it's always good to um, bring a sample birth plan with you when you're doing doula interviews so folks can know what you're able to provide and what you're comfortable providing for them during their birth experience. Um, birth plan should be trauma informed. That's a big thing that I think is often lost in this experience, in this like whole process. Birth plans need to consider what people are showing up with um, when they enter a space and birth can be a very traumatic experience depending on someone's life experience. There could be sexual trauma, there could be triggers that arise being in a hospital setting. So I think that's a very important thing to consider based on like what someone may want to input into their plan. They may not want to be touched by you, by their partner, by hospital staff. And that's something that has to be considered. They may not like loud noises. They may not like certain scents. And those are things, they may, may not even like certain language. And those are things that can be considered in a birth plan. I think when um, now something that I've considered way more in the last couple of years is like, making sure that someone's pronouns are on the birth plan. So not only am I respecting their pronouns and their identity, but that hospital staff or other people who may be in this space are, are um, respecting those um, identities. Um, and like I said, birth plans change. And I think that your birth plan is the ideal way that you would want to bring a person into the world. But you have to consider that the world is always changing. Um, like right now we're in a pandemic. And even outside of like something at this scale, things could always change um, just in someone's whole like birthing experience. So you're there to affirm that like, this is how we're gonna bring this person to the world, but it may not happen. At the end of the day, we want you to feel as mo the most comfortable and autonomous in this situation. So, Oma, um, can you go to the next slide? So this is a more visual birth plan. It breaks it down by stages. Um, so for the first stage is just like, you know, when you're um, in the beginning stages of labor and the last stage, is um, postpartum care. I included this because it includes pictures and I think that it's, this is an example of how you can be considerate of people's different learning and visual needs. Um, and this is something that could definitely be for the, for the birth workers who are in the space, for their support people who are in the state, for the other part, for the partner or parent. So this is just a way to make sure that you're being inclusive of people's needs. I think this one is pretty detailed without having, with, and with all these different symbols and everything. So, um, some considerations for birth planning during the age of COVID. I think one thing that I've been thinking a lot about in my um, job at the coalition, I work at the Domestic Violence Coalition, and we're thinking a lot about telehealth and how telehealth may show up in, for birthing people during the age of Corona. Um, people, they may not have a lot of, may not have as many in-person visits. Doulas may not be able to be in the room. Um, your insurance companies are changing their policies around telehealth. So I think during the birth planning stage now, we need to be considerate of how hospitals and insurance companies are incorporating telehealth into their um, plans, specifically for hospital births. They may, the whole orientation of the hospital may change. Um, so there may be different entrances. There may be different um, requirements to enter hospitals or to enter certain floors. 
And so those things can be considered in birth plans for support folks for, um, and for birthing folks. And also letting people know that like all the people that you wanted to be there may not be able to be there and kind of getting comfortable with the idea that some people who you want to be in the room may not be in the room. And how can we accommodate that by using FaceTime or Zoom or um, other technological means? That's definitely, I think, another added birth plan element that may not have been the same during like, you know, not a pandemic. <laughs> um, and I think other questions to ask are, um, how are hospital staff it's being exposed to, to um, COVID? And how are people in your direct support system being exposed to COVID? So who realistically can be in the room to keep um, the birthing person and the baby safe? Um, also just like limiting the amount of visitors during the postpartum time, like thinking about who will be able to visit the baby and support the birthing parent once the baby is here. And realizing and getting comfortable with the idea that that may be a very small number of people and that your birth and the postpartum care may not look the way that you thought it was gonna look, but that's the whole, you know, that's the whole reason we have a birth plan is to be able to shift and um, support this person in the way that they need, while also like supporting the needs of them and the baby and making sure that their, their health is the, you know, primary thing here. So I had one more thing that I wanted to touch on. Also, yes, yeah, skin to skin considerations. And I think um, Ms. Carroll covered this around like how hospitals may have different um, regulations and different um, considerations for that, but just kind of building that into the birth plan beforehand. So it's not a surprise once we get there. Also making sure that there are baby safe um, disinfectants and things in the home, um, post birth and thinking about around like postpartum needs as far as like, you may not be able to go to the grocery store so that we may have to incorporate um, Instacart or like delivery services. Things that we may not consider in the same way, you know, if we weren't living in such a precarious time, those things can also be inputted into a birth plan. And I think doulas and support um, systems for a birthing person can also help make those considerations a reality. And I think at the end of the day, a birth plan in this specific context is really important because some people may be laboring and birthing alone in a way that they never thought that they would be just because of the time. Parents can't fly in, friends can't fly in. Um, Partners may be essential workers and may not be able to support in the same way to just because you know it may be unsafe for the birthing person who, may, who could possibly be high risk. And so I think in this context, like a birth plan and a doula or a other support birth worker who's helping really can help someone be comfortable with the idea that their birth is not gonna, may not look the way that they want it to look, but we can put, making them still feel held and feel secure and the idea that their life is about to change in this really beautiful way, even though it's still a precarious time. And I think a birth plan is just a piece of paper, but it can be so much more than that if it's really held and intentional. So I think it's really important for us to be, you know, trauma informed, be intentional in our like writing and creation of them, and also just making sure that we're flexible. So this other, this person who we're supporting realize that flexibility is okay and flexibility is key here, and they can still have a wonderful and beautiful experience. It may just not look the way they thought it was gonna look. So I, th I have no more slides, <laughs> that's my information. There are so many different types of birth plans out there and a lot of them are not really c considerate of like blackness <laughs> and black um, birth experiences, but they are also very easily um, molded and you can very easily change them. Mm. And they change from depending on who you're supporting. So I always say, just look at a bunch of ones that are available online. If you have doulas and birth workers and midwives in your life who you trust, look at the templates that they have and you can kind of transform them based on um, what you can offer and based on the desires of that person. So there's so much, so many resources out there. Um, I really like Ancient Song Doula. They have a lot of great resources. Mm -hmm. So they have, they have a, um, good resources on their website. And also Mama Glow. Those are like two black owned, um, black centric spaces that I always look to. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, that's my segment on birth plans. <laughs> Thank you, Marcella. And um, we're going to um, kick it to Brittany, and I'm going to shift from this presentation to Brittany's presentation. And Brittany has fantastic birth plans. Like, Brittany's birth plans are, like, phenomenal. So I'm going to, ah, look at there. Look at Omi being ambidextrous with these presentations. All right. <laughs> Let me mute myself. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Brittany Thomas. Uh, super glad to be here um, and to 
meet the fellow uh, panelists or discussion um, ladies involved with discussion. I'm looking forward to de developing relationships with you all too because I'm kind of by myself in the whole doula world, even though I know there's a lot of black doulas around us. Um, we definitely need to get together more often. Um, and also I would love to work with other doulas too because I don't have a backup. I'm no one's backup and I would love to have the both. So um, digging right into it, we can go to the next slide. So um, our goals or my goal is um, for my presentation um, it's not limited to these four touch, touch points. Um, however, but I, I do believe they're really important um, especially to what the mother deserves in the um, postpartum stage. Um, I'm actually um, more focused on, on birth dueling, <laughs> um, but I, would, I do want to do postpartum. I do, um, and I have done a touch, a touch of it, but I want to get more into it, especially as my life changes um, and with children and things like that, it's just better kind of tailoring it because um, uh, both jobs have its, you know, its difficulties and, and its rewards. And I feel like I'm kind of moving towards postpartum. Um, so uh, going back to it, um, my first touch point is resources. Um, and this is basically um, letting them know that, or letting you all ladies know that um, there are accessible tools um, and services necessary for postpartum care. And then empowerment um, during this era uh, can be, you know, overwhelming, but we won't allow it to overtake us and safety, uh, what we can do from hospital to home to ensure safety of mama and baby, and then time. Um, that's just being mindful, um, being aware and having patience and letting time work for us and not letting it run us. So all of those um, spell out rest and that happened by accident, but not really accident. It just wasn't my plan. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so I put, you know, these little pictures to really explain that um, these are the things that we can tap into or mothers can tap into, excuse me, um, during the postpartum stage. Um, you know, see the phone that's powered off to where sometimes you just need to kind of unplug because it's a time for you to focus on yourself and your baby. Um, and then having a help of friends or you know designated people um spouses partners um to help you with things around the house and rest um like when you think of rest and postpartum people are like what rest um but you're supposed to have rest and that is go only going to happen with a support system um and so we go to the next slide so going into um what the postpartum stage is is often called the fourth trimester um, and it's a time after birth spanning from six months to a year. And I put an asterisk there because um, most people will say six months. Um, I like to say, and in several trainings I've been in, they say a year because, and it makes sense because the CDC and uh, the World Health Organization actually considers um, even maternal deaths um, a year after pregnancy. So why wouldn't that time be considered postpartum, right? It, and it just makes sense to me. Um, so I would say six months from a, uh, to a year. And, um, and then for some women, sometimes we go past a year. You know, you can't really put a, a complete stop on things, but um, those are the things that, that's the time span that's recognized. We'll go to the next one. So here, I love graphs. I love diagrams, <laughs> even if they're a little simple, but to me they're fun, especially when they have colors and all that stuff. But um, this is my little quick and small way of showing the things that we think about and hold of importance, and of course it's not everything, um, that we have on our plate or women have on their plates, mothers, before um, uh, before birth, prenatal, the prenatal times. And, uh, and as you can see, it's finances, spouse, family, and all of that. But then when you get into the postpartum, you have a whole nother set of things that you're thinking about on top of what you already had, right? So you can imagine that during this postpartum period, the changes you're going through mentally on top of what you're already going through physically, it's a lot to handle. So having a plan, um, before you get to that moment is, is really important. We go on to the next slide. So quickly touching on a feeding plan. Um, I spoke earlier about um, how the postpartum stage um, starts uh, just, just right after birth, really, because that's when um, 
the feeding of the, excuse me, your feeding plan should come to action. And that can be added to your, uh, your birth plan. Um, and that can consist of, you know, if you want to breastfeed or if you want to bottle feed. Um, I never like to say breastfeeding versus bottle feeding because we just never know what a mother wants to do and they shouldn't be judged either way of what they want to do because that's their choice. And they may have reasons that we, not, we don't know or that we don't understand. Um, of course, we want to give you know, the best information out there on breastfeeding because it's natural and all of the health benefits, um, especially during this time of pandemic when, when, um, when a mother's, mother's milk helps uh, uh, build the immune system and gives a defense you know, uh, uh, against illnesses. Um, and so um, that's something that should definitely be in the, in the birth plan. Um, and then also uh, the keep clean at all times. I put that in there um, because I read actually recently that um, uh, the COVID um, virus, it, it cannot be passed through breast milk. However, we still have the issue of the droplets, right? And so um, keeping hands clean, even around the breast area clean, of course, we don't want to put chemicals around there because that's where, you know, that's the baby's uh, turf. Um, but we definitely want to keep it just clean um, all together. Um, and as Cheryl said, mother having a mask, um, whether she is showing signs of uh, being positive or not, or um, showing symptoms. Um, that's a really important uh, aspect to have at this time as well. Go on to the next slide. So the first uh, letter of Ruth Rest, um, as you're planning for the first time, uh, your first time home with baby, gather resources that will set you up for assistance that will surely, that you'll surely need, um, essentially. So first I have ask healthcare provider, do look for referrals. And um, because more than likely, uh, and they should actually, um, doulas and your healthcare professionals should already always have referrals to where you can go for counseling, for therapy, um, a lactation consultant, just all types of things like that. Other doulas, postpartum doulas, um, uh, that can just help you in that time uh, so that you're, you're not left feeling alone or like you have no help. Um, and I have actually, I have a few resources that I can share as well that I was able to put in the slide, but um, I'll give you my information where I can, I'll put it in the chat where I can forward some uh, resources that I have. Um, assign designated, helper, designated helpers. So usually you, you're, you're automatically gonna have your partner, of course, if you have a partner or just someone that can help you. Um, during this time, I would only suggest one to two people because we just wanna keep you know, that spread of, of the virus um, as low as possible. And that's if you want people around at all, that's always up to um, the mother's discretion. Um, but I wouldn't recommend having uh, more than that um, for more than one reason. And I actually keep saying that more throughout the slides, but I'll explain that later. Um, also, um, uh, requesting a meal train. And that's basically with whoever's helping you um, asking if they can help put a meal train together so that you're not, like for me, anyways, I'm always thinking about food for my kids or for my family. And so while I'm, if I'm at home with a baby, I may not even be thinking about eating for myself, even though it's very, very important. I'll get to that too. Um, but you, you, you could be thinking about how the, how is the whole family going to eat right now? And that actually should not be a concern of yours during that time. Um, and so that to have someone to help you uh, put together a meal train to where you can have meals coming in um, for however long you need um, would be a, a huge help during that time. So the E for empowerment. Um, so postpartum is a very vulnerable time for mom and baby um, and for immediate family members like other children that may be in the home and whoever else is in the home. Um, so two, we want to inspire the best mood and environment to keep and keep these things in mind. And like I said before, eating and drinking well and often. Um, eating and drinking, eating and drinking is not only important for the mother, um, even for mood, um, for energy, all of those obvious things, but also um, uh, it helps, you know, aid in, in the production of the mother's milk. Um, and I found that out the hard way with my first son. I wasn't hardly eating. I guess I, I was stressed or 
I, I had a lot of things going on. I was a new mother, didn't know a whole bunch. Um, also 25, like on me. And, um, and I wasn't really eating. And I was wondering, like, why is it so hard for me to nurse? Or why, is it, why am I not making as much? And it's because, duh, I wasn't eating anything. And so I didn't learn that, though, until later. And I didn't have anyone around me to even inform me of that. Um, but of course, as you, um, you know, you learn more, you do better. Um, and so moving forward, the rest of my children, they were nursed because I knew how to take care of myself and how that aided in, you know, taking care of my babies. Um, and also uh, limiting, uh, limiting, excuse me, visitors, um, if any at all. Once again, um, I say that mostly because, uh, like we said, like I said before, of of lessening the or flattening the curve, I guess, um, with, you know, just trying to keep germs away. But also there's other things like um, getting advice overload, um, unsolicited advice. Um, and of course, advice is good when you when you seek it. Right. When you have people always telling you, you know, you should do this and you should that, you know, you get this feeling of like just being overwhelmed, like, oh, God, like, you know. I don't need all this right now because I, I don't know whether if I should do this or do that, should I be bottled for, you know, you know, you just go through all of those changes. And so, um, so that's one thing why I say limit of visitors because it, it will create anxiety and anxiety, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that comes from that stress, lessen your immune system, all those types of things. So limiting visitors for that reason. And also negative energy. You have people who mean well, but will give you all their horror stories. <laughs> and that's something you don't need to hear during that stage. Um, and so that's another reason why um, I say limit visitors. Um, sleep when baby sleeps. So we all hear that all the time, but it is so real. That rest, nothing is more important than rest at the moment when the baby is resting. Because that energy you are going to need um, later on. Um, also, um, actually uh, using your resources. So um, a lot of us feel like we can do it all and actually kind of spills into the next one being gentle with ourselves and not being super mom. Um, when we have resources to really tap into those resources because um, they're just sitting there waiting for you to grab them. And a lot of times we try to do things on our own and it doesn't make sense if we can have all the assistance that's available to us. Next, um, as for safety, um, in the era of COVID-19, safety has gone to a whole new level. As we all know, it is so imperative um, that protective and precautionary measures are taken serious. So um, cleaning your spaces thoroughly and often, um, keeping hands clean and at all times and away from your face, um, a safety of your mind. This is what I'm getting to um, here. If you feel especially down or having dark thoughts, um, please let someone know, especially if you do have a doula um, and, and in, in direct contact with your uh, healthcare provider. Um, it is really encouraged that you speak to someone about that because, um, like I said before, there are resources out there and you're not alone and it's not um, uncommon for uh, women to go through postpartum depression or just the baby blues and some people don't even know the difference. Um, because that can be a little fuzzy for some people. So um, always know that you have someone to reach out to and to talk to. Um, and again, limit visitors. <laughs> and lastly is time and how time is on your side. Um, hopefully there, there's no one around you that's rushing to do anything in, during this time because it creates a lot of anxiety, right? When you're thinking about snapping back, that's like the last thing that should be on your mind, if anything. Um, I, we live in a snapback culture, right? Um, where even some snapback is not even really real. Because um, <laughs> your body is not even, even if you get down to the, the whatever weight or whatever number you're trying to get to, your body is not the same. Um, and so focusing on snapping back, we can push that back and focus on health. Health is what's most important in health of mommy, health of baby, um, health of your mind, um, and, and, and uh, really focusing on that and keeping your anxiety down as much as possible, um, you know, to ward off illness, especially. And again, 
limit those visitors <laughs> because you need time to yourself, time to your family. Um, and once again, I say, you know, keep the people you want around you as much as possible who are really there to help you. Um, but outside of that, it's really important that you protect your space and your energy. Um, and lastly, these are a few links um, that are like the ones I like to send uh, my clients. Uh, there's one on breastfeeding. And I'm sorry, I double type that, but the next one is not breastfeeding. It's actually a what to expect right after birth. And the last one is actually a video um, that I came across that also speaks about um, COVID-19 and postpartum care um, by uh, some uh, healthcare workers at UCLA um, who had some really good pointers um, about what to do during this time um, as they're, you know, experiencing firsthand. And that is all for me. I hope I was within 15 minutes. I wasn't checking my time. You did fine. So thank you, Brittany. So uh, before we open the, the, the floor up for folks to ask questions, I wanted to say um, a little something around um, this energetic exchange that we just were benef the beneficiaries of. And I, I, I appreciate each person who I reached out to um, it was an immediate yes. Um, folk were like, I, I absolutely want to figure out how we can be part of this conversation and what I can offer. And I, I believe in supporting people. So we made this free, but we can also offer a love offering. So you'll see on the slide, the cash apps for Brandy, Marcella, and Brittany. And then I'm going to put in the chat Cheryl's email address because she does have PayPal. And so if you feel so moved to provide a love offering to folk and say, look, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you for kind of walking me through some things that helped me figure out what it is I need to do, how I can prepare, what question you may have answered some questions that you had for yourself. Um, I'd really like for you all to consider um, making a little a love offering for folks. So Cheryl's email is C Carol 27 at hotmail.com. So if you decide you would like to offer a love offering to Cheryl, you can, there you go, whoop, send a PayPal love offering there. And then you see the cash apps that are up. Brandy's is Fonty because a thoughty is an auntie and a thought. Thoughty. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Marcella is young, gifted, and broke. And Brittany's is really like, I was like, Brittany's is so straightforward. It's like BTNC. B. Thomas, I'm in North Carolina. BTNC. It's very easy. It's very easy. You can't mess that up. So, um, but I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen and I'm going to open up the space so that if folk have questions, you have two options. Um, down at the bottom of your screen where it says security, participant, and chat. If you go to participant and you find yourself, you want to ask a question, you, there's a hand icon. You can click on the hand icon and it'll pop up and I'll be like, oh snap, Melanie has a question. Oh snap, Erica has a question. And then I know who has a question and then I can take your hand down once you ask the question. If you don't want to ask the question yourself um, verbally, you can also drop it in the chat and we will, we will field questions there. So we have you know, about 15 minutes or so to, to entertain questions. So if anybody has a question, feel free to unmute yourself or to drop yourself in the chat and let me know if you have a question. Hello. All right, Kiera. I see Kiera's hand is up. So go ahead, Kiera. Hey, y'all. Um, thank you for all of this information. It's been wonderful. Um, I am wondering for the support that doulas can offer um, not in the room with their, with their people, how does, how, what's the recommendation for how that could look? Um, my experience has been that cameras and things like that have been shied away from not allowed for like video recordings and things like that um so i'm just imagining it 
imagining it being difficult to try to know what's going on and support um, the birthing person and not being able to physically see them. Are there any recommendations around that? Anybody can jump in and we'll just let our panelists just jump in. Um, so I'll go. Um, one thing that I've kind of been able to hold, um, especially because here uh, with Cone Health, you are not allowed to, they really don't even want you on FaceTime with people, let alone recording anything. Um, so what I've done pre-COVID, and I, I can see where it would be even more acceptable now, is just audio on the phone. They're more trusting of that. Um, they have their own reasons for not allowing recording devices. Part of that is liability. The other part is just space. Sometimes people definitely get in the way trying to record things. Um, but I think just strict audio is super helpful. Um, also, it's a little easier from my experience um, to do it through audio because I, you know, the phone has been able to be moved where I could hear what the nurse was saying, what the provider was saying, so that I can kind of listen in and take note. We're like with FaceTime or Zoom, I'm gonna be honest, hospital Wi-Fi is trash. Mm -hmm. So you also really don't want to rely on that either. You got nurses on the Wi-Fi, providers on the Wi-Fi, the whole hospital system is on it. So audio is also probably the most reliable, clear reception you're gonna get so that you can get a, a clear sound of what's going on in the room and you can also advocate over the phone clearly with no spotty signals, no repeating, nobody yelling what you say. Like the last thing you wanna do in the middle of a contraction is repeat yourself. So audio, honestly, is probably the best bet in a hospital right now. Is that helpful, Kiara? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Brandy. No, no worries. Does anybody else want to um, jump in? Um, any, you want to say anything, Cheryl or Brittany or, or Marcella? You good? No, I don't have a lot of a lot to offer in that area, though. I have seen um, uh, people do the the video and I didn't even think about it, uh, Brandy. I'm so glad you brought that up about the Wi-Fi. Um, and typically in a hospital, it is trash. Um, and the last thing you want is like in the middle of saying something of trying to, you know, um, calm calm the mother down is to be breaking up, you know, and I can imagine how that, you know, fluidity can be can be broken. And so um, yeah, audio I would suggest that too is probably the best mm -hmm. way to go. Um I, one time I did a whole birth through, and this is going to sound crazy, guys, because it is crazy, but I did it through DM, Instagram DM, and yes. so I know, and that was probably the great. I'll tell y'all that on another time, but one of the greatest experiences I've ever had, actually. Um, but you know, it's possible. It's possible. Mm -hmm. All right. Other folk have questions. All right. Is that Jelia? Did I get it right? Uh, Jalia. Jalia. Thank yes. you, Jalia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, ladies. Um, I'm actually Brittany's little sister. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah. So I'm happy to be here. I learned a lot. Um, I actually have a question for one of my close friends. Um, she's in her first trimester, her third child, and her first baby, she had a bad experience with her doula, um, and she had to end up having her baby. She wanted a home birth, so she ended up having to go to the hospital to have her baby, um, and last minute, her doula just wasn't supportive, and she felt, like, really disconnected from her, and her second baby, she had a VBAC, so she didn't have a doula, but I think for her third child, I think it's necessary in this time for her to do that, or I would like her to, so what advice um, could you give her to vet, first of all, a doula that works for her, and two, to ease her anxieties about um, having a child in this time? Sister Cheryl, do you want to take this question, and then maybe we can also take it to Marcella, and I'm going to, there you go. Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, you know, clear communication is paramount. And when you're interviewing, you're looking for a good fit. And I think I've heard it said numerous times, you know, this is not every doula is meant for every uh, mm -hmm. or every uh, client. And so you're asking questions. Uh, if there is a partner that you're working with, 
Um, it's nice to have a partner there too, to have a, a good sense of what it is that you look that you're looking for and to explain what was the bad experience, what negatively, uh, what was the negative effect and what do you wish could have been done differently. And so it's important to say that because sometimes um, people just need perspective on what happened or, or you know, maybe um, sometimes things are out of the control of the client, sometimes it's out of control of the doula and so uh, you're working under the best circumstances that you, you have, you know, you're doing the best that you can, but just to make sure that there is that clear understanding of what it is that you want and what you envision. Thank you. Um, Marcella, do you want to add anything to that? Or Brittany, do you want to add anything to that? I don't have anything to add. I think that summed it up. All right, cool. Any other questions? Oh, all right. Any other questions? Let's see. Hi, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Darlene. Um, I'm a birth doula and I'm also a um, childbirth educator. Um, I guess my question is for, is it Marsala? Um, mm -hmm. The birth, when you were talking about the birth plan, you showed that graphic, is that a, is that a graphic that we could access? Because I think that would be very helpful, especially during this time, like I've been doing a lot of virtual calls, through like Zoom mm -hmm. or FaceTime. Um, and I think it would be very helpful for a mom to have something that I can send to like their email and that, you know, even if they can't print it off, they have something that they could go by. And mm -hmm. it's nothing that they necessarily need to type into, but it, it's like a visual. I really like that idea and I yes. think that's something that, you know, could be very I'm just gonna send out the PowerPoint so that will be in it. I didn't create that. That was when I was um, a part of Birth Partners at UNC, that was something that they had in um, one of their part their PowerPoints, so I've used it. But, uh, so feel free to use that. But there's actually, um, there's this Instagram slash website, I think it's called like the Guided Birth. I went, I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure, but it's, a, it's run by a black woman. So she has, um, graphics like that whether it's black people and they have different types of identities and um, um partnerships that i think actually is better i just use that one because it's always on hand but i can send you or i can um give it to omi to send out to because there's an there are, are graphics like that that are more like black poc centric so feel free to use mm -hmm. that because it's going to be in the powerpoint okay thank you you're welcome you're welcome and also um Darlene, just uh, we were um marty saw put down in the chat that we are recording this so <clears throat> when we're recording into the cloud and then we'll grab it and we'll put it in a YouTube video and then we will share this um, and make it available um, to you all. I'll send out some information um, because I have your emails now um, because you registered, but I can also um, share it with the Facebook event and drop okay. it in the discussion there. And I can, if you're following um, either the Black Girl's Guide to Surviving Menopause or Spirit House, we can also share it that way too. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Um, also, um, I can address, um, is it Darlene? Mm -hmm. um, that I, um, and I shared on the chat earlier that I, I do create um, uh, birth plans, visual birth plans, because I'm also a graphic designer. And so that's a service that I offer my clients or anyone who just, who maybe like one of your clients wants one and then you can you know, outsource me to create it for you, um, I, I definitely wouldn't mind um, showing you the things that I, I do. Okay, great. Um, how would I be able to get like your, your contact information? So um, you can just hit me up on Instagram. Um, mm -hmm. Two accounts. The first one is my, my MA underscore Brit Brit. That's B-R-I-T, B-R-I-T. And then my doula Instagram is my doula. So that's M A underscore doula. Okay. Thank you. I'm dropping it in the chat. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? There you go. So I just dropped it in the chat, Darlene, so that you can have it. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we are about four minutes from ending. So I want to give 
<clears throat> anybody else an opportunity to ask a question, but I also wanted to express again, um, really deep gratitude for Cheryl and Brandy and Brittany and Marcella for um, offering your, your wisdom to this moment. Um, I've been thinking a lot about folk who are pregnant and trying to prepare for birth. I've been thinking a lot about folks across the board around like how we take care of ourselves. But I also was definitely imagining like, what would it feel like right now to be pregnant and try to figure out like, what do I need? And also there's so much like not clear information out there around protocols. And so being encouraged to um, be an advocate for yourself and ask the right questions of folk feels really, really um, important. So I'm um, thankful for each and every one of y'all for taking time out of your schedule this evening to be a part of this conversation. Um, if you're pregnant and are preparing for a birth, we're sending y'all the best, the very best energy. Yeah, like the very best. Um, I love the way Cheryl put it. It's like the way that we are made is so amazing. Like we, our bodies are just like these magnificent things. And so, you know, sending good energy for your body to do exactly what it was made to do, right? Um, and if you are at birth work, if you're a doula or a midwife, um, lay doula, you know, I count myself as one of those people and you find yourself in space of holding energy to support people, I hope this was helpful for you. And I hope it's also empowering you to remember the beautiful gift that you can offer to somebody um, who might be trying to prepare themselves um, for the arrival of a new baby during this time period. So I think I see some, there was a chat question real quick. Oh, Marcella dropped in there. Oh, you're welcome, Melanie. Thanks for, for being a part of the conversation. Um, the educatedbirth.com is the resource with the graphics and the info featuring BIPOC, which is Black Indigenous People of Color birthing people. And I think it's also important to because there are people who are giving birth who do not identify as a woman or who are gender non-binary. And so being clear about what someone, how someone identifies and what they want to be called in their birthing process is like the highest level of respect. So we don't misgender people or we don't identify people erroneously as they're going through this fantastically magical process. It's like, you know, that's important. So I'm going to um, end this call. I'm going to stop recording right here. Boop, boop, whoop.